Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. You join me in beautiful Southern California with my Nissan Leaf. My friends Patrick and Liv have been living with the Leaf for the past couple months since I brought it out to them. But if you guys have been following the Leaf story, this was the cheapest electric car for sale in the country. I thought it would make some great videos, and truly, I love the car. But there's one issue with it. It doesn't charge on AC. I have to use Chatamo to get energy into the battery pack because the onboard charger has failed. Well, we brought the vehicle out to Patrick and live in California so that we could actually bring the vehicle to QC Charge. And QC Charge is an electric vehicle repair specialty shop working on a whole bunch of cool things. We're gonna take you on a full tour of them. And throughout the process, we're also going to swap in a new onboard charger. So it should be kind of fun. It's a great way to see, okay, what happens to older electric vehicles as they age, what maintenance is needed because they are not 100% maintenance free like a lot of people might wrongly tell you, um, but it's also not very maintenance intensive. So we're gonna talk all about old, weird electric cars, maintaining them, and of course, getting our Leaf back up and running and charging, most importantly, on AC power. Very much looking forward to this one. Thanks for joining. Let's jump into it. You guys join me here at QC Charge with my friend Alex. How's it going, sir? It's going all right. Uh, those, I guess, early followers of Out of Spec, I swung by years ago to your previous shop. Yeah, that would have been after your, your first Cannonball run, right? That's right. We did the yeah. Cannonball in the 2019 Model 3. And so you've moved to a new building with a huge garage now. Yep, we've got a little over 5,000 square feet here of uh, most of it shop space, a little bit of office space too, of course. And, just uh, amazing. Yeah, where we work on lots of lots of EVs, and as you see, we have a ton of RAV4 EVs here in particular. That's kind of, uh, you could call it our mascot, for lack of a better term. Right, I mean, in the RAV4 EV community, it's you guys, the top shop. I mean, I know a few RAV4 EV owners out there. It's just QC Charge is the go-to for these things. So why do you have, how many do you have here? You've got to have 15 of them. Jeez, let's see. I bet we have... We have at least 15, maybe even closer to 20. <laughs> closer there's, to there's 20. There's a couple more down that way and a few in the shop. And Amazing. Yeah. So just, like, and maybe you could tell our audience who may not be so familiar with the RAV4 EV because this is a car, everyone thinks the Toyota BZ4X is the first electric Toyota, but no, actually this is, this isn't even the first electric Toyota. Yeah, exactly. So back in the, back in the 1990s, of course, California implemented their first zero electric our zero emission vehicle mandate. And Toyota had a RAV4 EV at that time. So it would have been based on the on the first generation, you know, Toyota RAV4 platform. Those are pretty rare cars anymore. I think as of like maybe 2003, there were only like 400 of them that were saved from the crusher. How oh, many are wow. left these days? Don't know, but I'm, it's gotta be a much smaller number than that. Yeah, maybe a hundred. I saw one in Santa Monica a year ago, just street parked. It was so cool. Yeah, every once in a while you'll see them around. I've seen one or two out in the wild. Um, we had one that, that we had come by our shop here that we did a repair on. Um, obviously, that's a, a very, very specialized car, um, you know, in terms of being being able to work on those. There's actually uh, a guy up in Eugene, Oregon, that specializes in those and the Ford Ranger EV. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Ford Ranger EV had the paddle charger, right? Uh, the, rain, the the RAV4 EV had the paddle charger. The Ranger EV used the Avcon, actually. Oh, interesting. Kind of big, big clunky square thing. Yeah, uh, I did not know that. That's pretty neat. Actually, funny enough, we stopped um, when when we were up in San Luis Obispo for te for the Tesla takeover. We, we went uh, to dinner on Saturday night, and when we were leaving the, the place where we had parked, I actually saw a paddle charger in the parking lot. Oh, I've no ne way. never actually seen one out in the wild, and I have no idea if it worked. Oh. But it was sitting there on, a, on like kind of a pedestal. I would have made a whole video about that. We got to go back there at some point. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I'll have to see if I can figure out on a map where exactly we were at. Oh, that's amazing. But it is in San Luis Obispo. Yep, it was in San Luis Obispo, so. That is neat. So, of course, you had first gen, you know, RAV4 EV, Ranger. There was also an S10 electric back then? There was an S10. The S10 is super ultra rare even even in those days it was it actually used the the gm ev1 powertrain oh i did not know that drive and all that um i actually used to have a couple of ranger evs 
I never did get either of them running, but um, one of them I actually sold to a guy in Germany who had a running and driving S10 EV. Oh, wow. Um, which has got to be, you know, I'm sure one of maybe a single digit number left. Yeah, and it's in Europe. <laughs> and it's in Europe of all places, which is even weirder. Uh, so then, you know, this is the second generation RAV4 EV, and this is what you guys really specialize in. Yeah, this is kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, this is like our mascot here at QC Church. Um, this is basically kind of the car that more or less kind of started the business. And, you know, back, uh, you know, a little over 10 years ago when, when, when Tony first founded this company, most of our business was in charging equipment. Um, and he owned a Toyota RAV4 EV, and actually the, the very first product that he ever really built was a, uh, a modified Tesla mobile connector, a UMC. Um, oh, interesting. And the, the RAV4 EV can charge at 40 amps on a level two, which at the time, 2012, there wasn't really anything else that could charge at 40 amps. Besides. Even today, yep. it, there's very few cars. I mean, there's more than back then, but right, the, yep. it's, uh, you know, 40 amps is still the, the standard. Right, exactly. So back then there were basically zero options for any kind of mobile charger that you could get that would actually do 40 amps. But Tony knew that the, the Tesla mobile connector could do 40 amps because um, this uses basically the same comp components as Model S. Um, and what he did, he bought a mobile connector chopped the plug off and put a J1772 plug on it and, you know, basically crossed his fingers and hoped it would work. And it did. So, um, you know, he, he built 10 of them to try and recoup his costs from building the one for himself. And he sold them all basically right away to, to other RAV4 owners and everything kind of snowballed from there. Very grassroots beginning. Yep. So we, we built the, uh, the J long, which is a J1772 extension cable. We built the J adapter stub, which is a, uh, a, an adapter that lets you charge a non-Tesla EV on a Tesla, um, you know, destination charger. Um, and then, of course, a little bit later on, what Tony developed was the DC fast charging kit for the Toyota RAV4 EV. Right. That was the fascinating thing yep. for sure, because then it took your honestly relatively good range, very powerful electric SUV yep. and made it so you could actually road trip. Yeah, and exactly. people have gone on some road trips with this kit. Yep. I've, I've personally driven one uh, basically from down here all the way up to the Canadian border. Uh, I've also done at least one or two trips to the Bay Area and back. Um, it's a little bit, you know, painful on a car, you know, at the, you know, it's not the fastest charging speeds and the car doesn't have a ton of range, at least by modern standards, but it makes it, you know, a pretty capable car for, for doing that. It's not that much worse than a Bolt. It's not probably not much worse than a Bolt. Um, you know, probably not much worse. Actually, it's probably a, a little bit better than a Leaf. Yes. Um, at least an older Leaf. Um, so the Chatamo kit, I'm trying to remember back on these things. Weren't they under the hood? Yep, it goes under the hood. Do you have any that we can see with the kit? Um, I do. We can probably open up the hood on... I have one in the shop that has one under the hood. Okay, we'll show that to the viewers in and there. Yeah, we, we can take a peek at that one. But basically, the, the gist of this car, um, for those that don't know, this car was built under a partnership between Toyota and Tesla from 2012 to 2014. And that kind of makes it a really cool piece of history. Um, I would even argue that if it weren't for this car and the partnership that sparked it, Tesla may not exist today. Out of the partnership that they had with Toyota, they had, I think it was a hundred million dollar investment and they acquired the, the Fremont factory. So, you know, that, that partnership got them a long ways. And of course, as a part of that, they, they built the RAV4 EV. Now, will Toyota service these anymore? Will they even recognize that they built this car? Or Because I know there's some dealers with some factory equipment still left on them. What's the story with that? Yeah, so the dealership experience, experience on these cars is really hit or miss, especially for cars that have been, you know, exported outside of California. Um, there's a few dealers that still work on them and are relatively knowledgeable in the cars um but they're also a little bit crippled in some ways by supply chain and what they can actually do to repair the cars i don't know what if they're under contractual obligations with with tesla or, or what the deal is but you know in a lot of cases um all that they can really do is remove and replace components um you know whether that's a drive unit or a battery pack or whatever um when a lot of the time they could be repaired for for a lot cheaper than than what it would cost to simply just you know throw a new part in and that's where you guys come in of course and we'll talk about the rav4 ev repair business because yep. to me that's yeah. super fascinating that this old rare kind of like unheard of electric vehicle is your bread and butter yeah it's uh you know it's kind of 
been our, our staple thing. We've obviously expanded a lot, you know, beyond just the RAV4 EV, but it's still very much kind of our, our specialty and it's the thing that people really know us for. Well, let's go through, let's see some cars because I also see some other interesting things up here. There's a Tesla Model S with almost half a million miles on it, you were saying? Um, well, that one's actually down that way. Oh, so that's the Model S down there. Yeah, okay. All the way down on the end there. Okay. This is actually a, a customer car here. Um, and what's going on with this one? So this one was here for battery repair. We've mostly kind of finished up the battery repair portion. Uh, we have a couple things to button up on it, and then we're also going to rebuild the drive unit on it. Um, Interesting. And, yeah, so that's, you know, kind of a, a fun bit there. And it's a very similar motor in the early Model S to what powers these, and we'll show those inside. Yep, yeah, they're, they're basically, you know, the motor portion of it is actually identical. The only real differences are the uh, you know a little bit of programming on the power ele electronic side and a few differences with the gear reduction interesting very cool and i also just have to bring our attention down here to what a lot of people thought was a euro only car um, but it was homologated and you know federalized for u.s sale in electric only which is the b-class electric drive or i think later they were B250Es? Yep, that's correct. So these cars, would we would consider to be kind of the sister car to the RAV4 EV. They basically have the same powertrain. Are they that similar? Yep, it's, it's you know, still a, a Tesla-powered car. Um, once you get into the little bit later years, they kind of diverge a little bit. Uh, they went to a second generation onboard charger and a few other things, but the motor itself, um, apart from the inverter, you know, basically from the inverter over, uh, the motor and the gearbox on this car are identical to a RAV4, and a lot of the parts are actually, you know, basically interchangeable between the two. And Did not know that. And yeah. how similar are the battery packs in these to the Model S? So the battery packs are kind of a similar construction method. Um, we can actually look a, take a look at one that's opened up inside. Cool. Um, but the construction method is really similar. It's all 18650 cells with the little, you know, wire cell taps. Yep, the wire bonds, yep. Kind of the individual you know, fused cells. Uh, the size of the modules is different and the way that they configure them is a little bit different. In the RAV4 EV, for packaging reasons, they kind of stack some of the modules on top of each other. And in the B-Class, they're actually kind of narrow and long and they actually put them on end and they stack them really? front back. Yeah. Wow. You know, it would be similar, at least the layout that the modules are in would probably be more similar to what you might expect to see in like a an LFP Model 3 pack. How about that? Yeah. Really fascinating. But it, but it is still 18650s and the, the construction of the modules themselves is similar to them. And they're the same cells that they were using for Model S, right? It's actually the cells that were used in the Roadster. Oh, really? Yeah, so it, it's a little bit freakish. Uh, they're 2600 milliamp hour 18650s, which is not very energy dense by modern standards. Sure. Uh, from what I've heard, supposedly Tesla actually offered to, to, to Toyota to use the higher capacity cells that were used in the Model S, and Toyota basically said no. <laughs> That's um, such a Toyota move. <laughs> yeah, such a Toyota move. Obviously, they they didn't really want to build this car. They built the basically the minimum required number to meet California regulations. But they used the Euro lighting, because these these lights front and rear were never available in the U.S. Yeah, other I, than on the electric ones. I don't know if these are a Euro lighting or if there's some other weird, you know weird thing going on. Okay. The funny thing about the RAV4 EVs, so these were built from 2012 to 2014. Anybody that knows, you know, just normal gasoline RAV4s, the RAV4 actually changed body styles in 2013. And the RAV4 EV stayed with the old third gen body. Wow. So all of the bodies for these cars were actually built in 2012 and basically just stockpiled in a warehouse somewhere in Canada. Oh, no way. So they literally just built them and shipped them to Canada. Uh, well, or were they built in Canada? The body is built in, in Canada. How about that? Um, so the, the, if you look at the VIN number and do the decoding, the cars are actually built in Canada. So, wow. Um, and yeah, so they basically just stockpiled the bodies there. And then, you know, as each year went by, they would basically pull bodies off the shelves, put the components in them, you know, put the VIN on it for whatever year it was, and then, you know, ship them out the door. To oh neighbors. my gosh. Fascinating history. Thank you for all of that. And there's more to come. Yep. Let's talk about this beautiful majestic beast over here <laughs> yeah so we've got your your nissan leaf here um is this a, a 2011 or a 2012 i believe a 2012 we should okay. double check that yeah so the 2011 and 2012 are you know basically 
same difference. Right, identical versions. This one, though, I'm pleased to tell you, is the SL version. Oh, yes, the SL, the fancy one. The fancy with, one. With Chatamo charging, which yes. would not be so good in, in the particular case of this car. <laughs> right, if it didn't have Chatamo charging, we'd be screwed on this thing. Yep, yep. But it also has the solar panel. Yep, the little solar panel. Yeah, that's that's always kind of a fun little feature. Wow, the paint on the top of this is actually in really good shape. A lot of the time, the clear coat's all peeling off of the spoiler piece. Sure, of course. Well, you know, the whole car isn't in perfect shape, so uh, the car lived in Washington most of its life, and we bought it from the previous owner. When I showed up, he didn't realize it was us. He just happened to be a viewer, which was amazing. And so he told us the full history of this thing, and he really just daily drove it he was in an accident which actually totaled out the car and then he bought it back from the insurance company and never fixed it yeah. and so uh, i think i can't remember the exact price that we paid but somewhere in the three thousand dollar range for this car uh maybe thirty seven fifty if i remember exactly yeah. probably you could find a cheaper one today but at least a year ago when the prices were crazy this was the cheapest electric car in the country yeah i mean the, the beauty of a leaf is it's a pretty simple car that generally there's not a lot that fails on them. Unfortunately, the Achilles heel on the 2011 and 2012 model in particular is, of course, the onboard charger. Uh, 2013, they actually changed a lot of the, basically everything about the car was totally changed. There's almost nothing that this car shares in common with a 2013 or newer. Really? So 2013 had a major electrical overhaul yep. from the 2012. The, all of the high voltage electrical components are totally different. Uh, even the body, while it looks the same, is actually substantially different. The 2011 and 2012, the doors and the hatch and the hood are actually aluminum. On the 13 and newer, they went to all steel construction. Ah, so lightweight race car. <laughs> yep, another another kind of fun fun little uh, fact about the Leaf. And yeah. wow. Did not know that. Well, let's run inside. Show us what's going on in here. Obviously, we're here after hours, so it's the evening time at the moment. Um, but we are going to come back tomorrow to do the repairs. So uh, the Leaf is ready uh, to have the onboard charger done. But beautiful entrance right here. Nice building. Yeah, we've got our, our nice signage and all here. Um, basically, when we moved into this place, it had just barely gone under new ownership. They've actually done a lot of work to the property. They repainted everything. And uh, they actually did quite a bit of work to us uh, for this unit when we moved in, which is pretty cool. Amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful unit. Yeah, we... Uh, and what's the name of the exact town that we're in? So this is Vista. We're in kind of a weird part of Vista because we're right on the border of uh, Carlsbad, which is probably only about maybe less than a quarter mile that way. Oh, interesting. And if you go about another quarter mile that way, you're in San Marcos. Okay. So we're kind of in this weird area of, of corners and yeah. So love it. You guys, of course, have a YouTube channel. So like and subscribe, we QC do. Charge everywhere. We'll make sure that's linked so everyone can check it out. Um, love the Elon poster. Yeah, Elon, <laughs> it freaked me out when I walked in. I was like, who's just standing there? Yeah, Elon creeping, in, creeping there in the corner. It's so funny. He's watching over you guys. Um, super awesome. So yeah, we just have like some of the history of the company here, right? Like this is the stuff I'm familiar with that you guys played a large part of part yeah, in. These are some of the old adapters and stuff, and we've got some some other kind of fun paraphernalia, parts parts from cars. We've got, you know, gears from inside of large drive units. There's a coolant pump down there. Uh, we've got kind of the, the distribution bus bar for, uh, let's see, is this a Model S inverter? I believe so. Um, and then you guys also yeah. don't just repair electric cars. You also sell adapters and things like that yeah. such as this right here which is a tesla input to j1772 output and we've seen a lot of copies of this over the years of course but i have one of these and i use it all the time and it still rocks yeah i mean these are this is you know we were basically the original that came up with this and of course there's there's lots of knockoffs now uh with the start of the pandemic we kind of were in not such a great situation as far as the manufacturing stuff goes and we haven't really built much of any charging equipment since basically the pandemic started. We were kind of shut down on that, and that was actually kind of the big push that really pushed us towards the, the vehicle repair side of things. Interesting. Which we were doing prior to that, but not anywhere near the volume that we are now. Right, right so that's why you guys moved to the new shop, because you're going hardcore into vehicle repair. Pretty much, yep. And we're, we're still hoping to, to kind of 
focus a little bit more on the the charging equipment stuff in the future we want to build more fast charging kits for the rav4 and the b class and all that yep absolutely and what we're hoping to do on kind of the next generation of those kits that we're going to do is add either ccs or nacs now we're talking one, one of those options what i really want is for you guys to come up with some sort of adapter so i can nacs charge the leaf that's a little bit of a tough one there's a lot of people that want to see that happen and there's probably going to be a way to do it one way or another at some point in the future whether it's us or somebody else that that does it first um because yeah eventually it's it's going to be a reality that but you'll need a full happens. communication interface box right pretty much it'll be probably you know whatever it would be it would have to be pretty similar to what what our jdmo does where it's going to kind of spoof the can signals on the car you know to be able to facilitate the charge session yeah um, but it worth works, it yeah I mean, uh, someone's got to do it because all these old Leafs, like Nissan should honestly do it, in my opinion. They sold, they're still selling all these cars with Chatamo, which is a dead charging standard, like make an adapter for the whole world. Yep. I don't remember the exact number of Leaf production off the top of my head, but I want to say it's over 600,000 to date. Yeah, I maybe think maybe a million. Is it over a million? I don't know, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a lot. It's, it's a very large number of cars out there for sure. Yeah. Um, which, you know, obviously not all in the U.S., but... There's a huge number of Nissan Leafs in the U.S. And, you know, a lot of people that, that own the Leafs are, are passionate about them and, and really like them and, you know, basically want to keep them. So. Right. Absolutely. And if even if you can get CCS on there, CCS to NAX adapters work, too. And it's not yeah. like the cars pull that much current where we're not getting into, like, dangerous levels right. of anything. Yep. So Exactly. Well, let's go show the uh, shop back here. I think on the way, one thing I wanted to mention was we've seen a lot of Bjorn's videos over in Norway and some others. There are a lot of electric vehicle repair shops popping up in Europe, but not in the U.S., you guys are one of a very small handful that are doing, you know, EV repair, component repair in the whole country. I mean, there's just yeah, not there's, that many. There's not very many. Um, there's only a handful of shops that, that are really specialized in this kind of thing like us. And everybody kind of has their own specialty that they focus right, on. Right. You got the Roadster guys. You got you the got, Roadster guys. Yep. You've got the guys that focus more on the battery stuff. Um our main focus is drive unit repair, but we've also, you know, done some some battery repair stuff. Um, and anyway, yeah, there's there's a lot of different things that go on. But as far as I know, we're pretty much the only shop in the country that I know of that does any kind of, you know, volume sort of repairs doing drive unit rebuilds. I know that there's a few people that have kind of experimented and dabbled with it but nobody that's really doing it as a... Right, and their own like sort of processed situation. Yeah. And one thing, it would be cool to see what the audience thinks, but I was thinking about, hey, why don't we find an old, ratty RAV4 EV and sort of bring it back from the dead with you guys? It could be an interesting series in the future. Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of cars out there, and there's a, there's a couple different common failure modes that, that are, you know, common areas to see problems with. Um, I would say that most likely if you found a dead rav4 it would probably do to be due to bad battery contactors which is a, a pretty common repair that we do on these and um yeah it's kind of one of those one of those failures that's kind of i don't know if i want to say inevitable but it's kind of a, a known issue that, that we see on the cars. Yeah, I know a couple RAV4 EV owners, and I've actually done a track review of one of these, which was hilarious. They're fast. They're pretty fast. And, and they don't handle very well. No, it was really bad, but it was really fun. Yeah. And uh, one thing I thought that was interesting through that was talking to the owners. Yes, this contactor problem came yep. up for sure. Um, but this is a motor out of a RAV4 EV, right? Yep, so this one is actually out of a RAV4 EV. I'm actually working on putting this one together uh, I, you know, had it all apart and I basically put it together today. It's out of the, the white RAV4 right here. This car actually got shipped to us for repair all the way from Wisconsin. Oh, wow. Yeah. So how did it end up in Wisconsin? That is a good question, but a lot of these cars end up in all sorts of funky places. It's not the furthest away we've had a car shipped from by any stretch. Um, but we get, we get cars shipped from all over. Just last week, we shipped one back to, uh, Georgia. A uh, couple weeks before that, we shipped one to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Oh, no way. Uh, the very first RAV4 EV motor that I ever rebuilt, which wasn't a resounding success by any means, <laughs> um, but the very first one that I ever rebuilt was actually in a car that had been shipped to us from Norway. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So, they're, there's actually, so they literally shipped the whole car from Europe. They shipped the whole car from Europe. Um, and what we ended up doing on that one, actually, is we took the brand, at the time, it was basically almost a brand new motor out of Tony's personal car, put it in that one and shipped it back. And he got the crappy motor that, <laughs> that I rebuilt and made all sorts of noise and vibrated and whatever. Okay. But now your rebuild's much better than back right, then. Exactly. That was, uh, that was probably over five years ago that that happened. Very and funny. We've, uh, we've, you know, developed the process since then. And we, we've kind of built our own supply chain of parts and yeah. It's pretty amazing. So I know you have a RAV4 EV back here. Does this one have the JDMO kit? Yeah. So this one actually has the JDMO kit on it. What's going on here just on our way over? This looks epic. So, so this is actually a large drive unit out of uh, a Model S P85. Um, Construction-wise, obviously, like we were talking about earlier, it's basically the same as far as the motor goes as the RAV4 EV. They're identical. Once you get to the gearbox, that's where the things start to change. So on the RAV4 EV, they actually mount the motor backwards from the orientation that it would be in a Model S. So obviously for, for forward direction of travel, your motor's spinning in the opposite direction. Um, so the gear set is actually different. You, you know, you've got your, your helical cut gears on the RAV4. They would be cut at the opposite angle. Huh, that's very um, interesting. Which I'm sure is a, either a wear or a noise, noise thing that they're trying to, to reduce. Uh, obviously the oil pump is optimized to spin in the opposite direction. And then the really big change is actually uh, the RAV4, on the RAV4 EV and the Mercedes B-Class, they actually have a parking pole mechanism that's added into the case, um, which I could, I could probably pull one down and, and show you what that looks but like. But that is still a point of contention in new electric cars. Certain automakers want a physical parking pole in there, yep. and others are comfortable using an electronic parking brake. Tesla's always been sort of ahead of the curve with electronic parking brakes, but yep, it is a failure point. Yeah, it's a, it's a possible failure point. And, you know, if you lost power or something, your, your electric parking brakes aren't going to work. I guess you could argue the same for an electrically actuated parking pole too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, a point of, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of meetings about this and, you know, when they're designing new cars and new powertrain systems and, for example, Magna is one of our sponsors and they offer their motors with a parking pole and without a parking pole, basically to suit whatever the OE decides to do. But it, it's actually something that's talked about more than you would expect yeah. because you have to plan for worst case scenario as the car ages with, you know, half a million miles or more, yep. you need to make sure things are reliable. But this is really cool to see. So this is Model S large drive unit. Yep, this is Model S large drive unit. And actually, let's see, can I pull the differential out? No, it's still bolted in there. Um, but if we look inside the case here, so you can see there's kind of this big round piece in the casting and underneath the differential gear, there's kind of some other casting artifacts, but that's actually all the casting artifacts left over from the parking pole mechanism that was engineered in from the beginning to work in the RAV4. Region. Oh, no way. So every Tesla has a, like a, a sort of fingerprint from the RAV4 EV, which they built, you know, maybe less than 1% of drive units of yep. and probably less than less than a half a percent. So if we look at the other side of the gearbox, you can see more, more of these casting bosses. So you've got that there. This would be another piece that's machined out and you have all these where other stuff would be able to bolt in for the parking pole mechanism. How about that? So interesting how Tesla was doing things in the early days to work cross platform. And of course, you know, we had talked about these vehicles only came with AC charging early on. So this is the very famous QC charge JDMO kit. And my understanding, and I really want you to tell us a little bit more about this, but my understanding is you have to keep the vehicle key on in order to use JDMO. Is that true? That is true. So that was not the original intention with the way the kit was built. Originally, the way that it was meant to be implemented um, was that it would basically spoof the car to think that it was charging. It'd spoof, uh, you know, basically the, um, your pilot and proximity signals and make the car, the contactors close so that the car could charge. Right. Based from the AC char side, right. you're saying. You basically spoof it to think that it's, you, so that it knows that it's going to charge and it'll close the contactors. And you're spoofing it on the AC side when you're really going to charge it on DC. Turns out that the car is smart enough to know that when it's charging on AC, the power shouldn't exceed 10 kilowatts. Oh, so there's a limit in there. Yep, there's a limit in there. And I, I think on the initial testing on these, once it reached like 12 kilowatts, it would shut off. Oh, interesting. Um, and 
And it would just open the contactors? It would, it would basically just open the contactors and stop charging. So pretty much the only way to make it work is to do it with the car on. Uh, you can still lock the car up at all with it on. Um, and you can turn off the center display and stuff so it doesn't look like the car is on. Sure, that's cool. And, and this box basically was made... Now, you did JDMO for a few different projects. You did B-Class, this, and Roadster, right? Yep, we did the Roadster, the B-Class, and this car. This was the original. Uh, the Roadster came a little bit later on. And then the B-Class we developed kind of from the same architecture that the RAV4 was based on. They're very similar cars, and all of the communica communication and stuff was very similar. It only required a few few software tweaks um, to make it all work, and then it was just a matter of actually making the hardware fit in the car. But how fascinating is it that you use similar drivetrain batteries, and they're integrated into a Toyota system or a Mercedes system? Very yeah. different automakers with different strategies, yeah. but the integration guys did a great job on both ends because both cars are OE cars that feel very OE. Yeah, I mean, it's they, they certainly did a very good job. The way the RAV4 EV works and kind of the, the B-Class by extension, the B-Class, I would say, is a little bit more integrated than the RAV4. Um, the RAV4 is almost operates like two separate cars. And the Tesla system is kind of independent of all the Toyota systems. And there's actually a, a, it's called a gateway computer that lives in the back quarter panel that kind of talks between the two. Oh, interesting. And so you have two OBD2 ports, one for the Toyota side, one for the Tesla side. And they, you know, neither one of those uh, OBD2 ports, you can't communicate with the opposite side. Oh, so they're either. totally separate. Yep, they're totally separate. Uh, the Tesla side has its own specific diagnostic software for the RAV4 EV, uh, which is, you know, just kind of another weird thing. If you try and pull codes from the Toyota side, if it has a, an error message, all you'll get is a PT P312F, which is check EV system. <laughs> How about that? That's yep. pretty amazing. That's, that's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so on, on the JDMO stuff, um, actually the, the bulk of the control equipment is actually under the plastic cover here. There's a, there's a big box with a couple of, a couple of big contactors, circuit card, and you know, all the wiring to make everything talk to each other. This is really just an inlet mount here, which is not, not mounted at the moment. We had to take it out to get some, get to the motor mounting bolts on here. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we actually tie into the battery on the bottom side of the car, um, we call it a, a bathtub, but basically it's a big chunk of aluminum that bolts on where the rest of the battery connections would go. And we basically add some standoffs and add the connections for our equipment. And Fascinating. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. We know uh, this kit made it possible for a lot of people to drive electric, uh, you know, with these vehicles. So it was a very needed and still needed apparatus to go on. Um, now, I feel like we could do five hours just on RAV4 EV, which I'd like to save because in the future, I would like to buy one and do a series with you guys. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a really fun thing to do. And yeah, there's so many interesting little tidbits and you know informational things about the RAV4 that yeah I could go on about it for for a long time. I know it's amazing and these are the best YouTube videos that we do when we get to go with an expert in their home turf and like learn everything um, and I feel like I've learned so much about RAV4 already so this Alex thank you that was amazing. Uh, let's move over to the LEAF project. Yeah so on the LEAF project so we've actually got our replacement onboard charger right over here um, so this is a, a used charger unit. Um, new chargers for the Leafs are a little bit difficult to get. Well, used ones are also difficult to get because these were only used for the two years, 2011 and 2012. So they're a little bit challenging and a little bit expensive to get a hold of. Um, this one came out of a, a lightly wrecked car that, uh, that basically got parted out. So Right, and it hasn't been tested, but we assume it was working at the time of the accident, at least. Yes, I believe. So the, the outfit that we got it from... Basically, it was a running and driving car, you know, despite it being wrecked. It's a running and driving car. Presumably, this is a good charger. So, um, you know, we haven't tested it ourselves, but hopefully it should be a good working. Well, we'll find out as soon as it gets in there. Yep, I guess we'll plug it in before we put it all back together. Yeah. Um, can you walk us through roughly what this charger does, what the connections are? And then, of course, tomorrow we'll go through the installation process. But what what is actually going on here? Because we may have some viewers who don't understand what an onboard charger even is. Right, yeah. So generally speaking, when you charge an electric car at home, your charger that you're plugging into isn't really the charger. That's what uh, what we would call in the industry an EVSE, which is short for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. 
basically all that it is is a box with some relays that close when you've actually plugged the vehicle in to allow AC power to flow onto the car. What this does is this does the conversion from the AC coming out of your wall to DC to go into the battery. So basically it's an AC to DC converter. Right, and it's basically matching pack voltage on the DC side and yep. charging it up. And, you know, why is it common that these fail? You know, it's not every car that has failure points, but uh, onboard chargers do seem to be, especially with older electric cars as they age and get mileage, this does seem to be a pretty weak link kind of across the board. Um, there's There's definitely some cars that have more problems than others. Uh, the early 2011 and 2012 Leafs, which are the ones that the only ones that use this charger are common to have problems once you get to the 2013 and newer they, they don't really tend to have issues uh other cars that have problems with the onboard chargers are any of the early tesla powered cars so the rav4 ev b class model s yeah model s is a big one the early ones for sure definitely yeah. launch onboard chargers and some of them have the dual you know 80 amp ones and you'd yep. lose one side but you still get 40 amps right yep yeah when you have the 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 dual chart when the onboard chargers on the model s which is the same one that's in the rav4 and the b class one is a little bit further modified but basically the same unit uh on those i'd say about it's about a 60 40 on what the failure is I'd say about 60% of the time, it's actually as simple as just a blown fuse, um, which there's actually one right here that I pulled out of a car the other day. Actually, it was the car we're rebuilding the motor on. So oh, okay. The original thing that car was sent here for was it didn't charge, uh, but it also had a pretty noisy motor and all, and that's why we're doing the motor rebuild on it. But yeah, originally it was sent here because it didn't charge, and it blew the big 50 amp fuse in the onboard charger. And did, is that because it pulled more than 50 amps, or what, what happened there? That's a really good question, and I'm not sure that I have a good answer for that, other than that it's a relatively common failure mode. Yeah, interesting. So, um, yeah, they don't always fail that way, but I would say, you know, 50, 60% of the time, that's what it is. Um, and then the rest of the time, it's some other internal failure. and um, Yeah, water got in there. Who knows what could yeah, really be. Board level repair. I've I've opened up, opened up before and seen, you know, smoke components on circuit boards. Other times you open it up and everything looks perfectly fine, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't work. Interesting. Um, and the Leafs in particular you were mentioning, for especially these early ones, had a, a failure mode that's very common. Yeah, so a really common failure mode, and this isn't always the case, but a really common failure mode is there's a, there's a diode in here. I can't remember if it's on the proximity or the pilot side. Uh, but basically, for those that don't know, what a diode does is it allows current only to flow in one direction, but not in the other. Um, it's kind of like a gate for lack of a better term. Um, and sometimes that diode can fail in a couple different ways. Uh, the first way is if it, if it fails in the open position, right? So it's blown open. So you no longer have uh, a circuit available for current to flow in, in either direction. Um, if that happens, there's not really much of a way to repair it unless you open the thing up and tried to do uh, a circuit board level repair. Now it's possible to do for, for people that specialize in that sort of thing, but for the amount of time and everything that it would take to, to take the conformal coating off the boards and stuff, it's, it's a complicated process. Um, but if the diode fails in the shorted position, which basically makes it no longer a diode, it's just kind of a pass-through where current can flow either way, that can actually be fixed by putting a diode in line behind the charge port which is kind of another um, interesting way to fix it. Right, and we see that all over the LEAF forums and everyone you know, mentioning that that could be a repair, of course. Yep, it's a potential repair if it's that particular failure mode. Um, I don't know what the odds are of that being the failure mode versus any of the other um, you know, ways for it to fail, but I'd say you know, it's probably somewhere in the you know, low to mid tens, you know, for, for percentage. Yeah, being so- like, You know, 20, 30% maybe. So. Right, sure. And uh, well, this came out of a crash car. You guys sourced it. I can't thank you enough for finding the onboard charger. And, you know, you had basically just seen our videos, knew that the car needed a charger. And yeah. we're like, and we obviously know each other. And you're like, bring it by. We'll slap this thing in for you. Yeah, for sure. And it's, uh, it's a repair that we've done in the past before. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty common thing. We get calls about it on, on occasion. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a relatively, relatively common thing we see on the Leafs. And it's, uh, it's a known, known problem. Cool. Well, I guess what we need to do now is get a beer 
<laughs> and then get to work in the morning. <laughs> and yeah. so yeah, for sure, we'll we'll get this thing thrown in tomorrow and. And uh, hopefully everything works out good on it. Be amazing. And then there's so many other things that we're going to get into tomorrow, like looking at the battery balancing. And um, my understanding is the Leaf battery won't top balance unless it's on AC. It won't DC top balance. I'm not totally familiar with the specifics on that, but that would make total sense to me. Um, and yeah, since it's probably been substantially deep DC charged for, you know, yeah, last, for the last year. Last year, um, you know, it's possible that the pack has become a bit unbalanced. Um, and on, that's kind of a common thing on older Leafs in general, is sometimes the packs become unbalanced. Right, so let's do, we'll do, we'll get this in. We'll at least top charge it tomorrow. We'll try and whack the battery into shape. I also want to talk about battery replacement options or upgrades as well, because uh, that could be a possible path forward with this car. Um, but for us, the, you know, the, the, the world is endless. We should see what we can do, you know, in the future. The car is going to be local with Patrick and Liv, at least for the foreseeable future. So tomorrow should be a blast. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, dude. Really appreciate all the tour and man, the, the expert level knowledge on the RAV4s especially is just, you know, that is so unique and so cool. So I'm glad you guys have found that niche. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of a, you know, kind of neat that we've fallen into that that niche and that's the RAV4 is really what got us started in the repair business is you know from from doing the fast charging stuff people knew that we knew the cars and then from there people started to ask if we could fix them and that was kind of what really got the, the ball rolling to get us to where we are now amazing well thanks again let's uh head out now and we'll see you all in just well for the, our viewers it's going to be two seconds but for us a few hours yep <laughs> the magic of editing well, you join us now. It is the next day. And uh, after a few beers last night, always a good time. It's time to get to work. Indeed. So what is the process? Um, and essentially, I don't want to make this a guide or a how to replace your, your uh, onboard charger. But I do want to give our audience an idea as to the process that you'll be going through and check in with you throughout the next few hours of the situation. There are some great tutorials online by some guys in Finland, and I'll leave that linked of like a how to, you know, full series. We don't need to replicate that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of guys that have great how to videos and stuff. Uh, but basically the process for replacing the charger on these 11 and 12 leafs of uh, the charger actually sits back here under this plastic hump right behind the rear seat. So it's basically going to tear apart the interior. We have to pull the rear seats out, uh, pull that, that, you know, plastic hump piece off, and then we'll be able to get access to the charger. There's a couple coolant lines we have to disconnect from the bottom and then some electrical connections. And of course, before we start on all that, we'll start with uh, disconnecting the high voltage and stuff. So that's right. kind of the first step. So how do we disconnect the high voltage? Is that the little plug in the floor? Yep, it's the plug in the floor. So the first thing we'll do actually is we'll disconnect the 12 volt battery mm -hmm. and then we'll disconnect the high voltage plug under the floor. Yeah. Cool, well, let's do it. All right. Let's see, so already got the hood popped here. Oh, nice. That's like YouTube ready right there. And of course it's got the, the backwards hood strut that's attached to the hood instead of, uh, <laughs> right. instead of the other way around. That's so weird. It's a little bit of an odd thing on them. It's got a brand new warrant, uh, brand new warranty, brand new battery in this thing. Yeah, brand new, brand new battery for yeah. Nissan. Yeah, I just put that in because uh, it bricked in the winter time. Oh yeah, that's a it's a common thing. Twelve volt batteries die on them, and then that's usually the the major source of issues on these cars as the 12 volt battery dies sure that's a pretty simple thing it is amazing though for their first you know sort of mainstream electric car and everything how robust these truly are. Yeah, I mean, they hold up pretty well. Um, beauty of a Leaf is that they're they're pretty dirt simple and they just don't tend to have a lot of problems. So apart from the charger thing. I mean, it just seems like a very economical vehicle to own. It has been for us so far. Again, this was the only thing I put in. And it was maybe 150 bucks. I don't know. Yeah. Something like that. And so for that being our only issue and now the onboard charger, I mean, what does an onboard charger um, swap cost at a typical shop or can typical shops even do this? Um, well, so I would say that it's something that a typical, typical shop probably could do. I think a lot of shops are a little bit afraid of electric cars. So a lot of shops, you know, don't really want to mess with them, but any shop that does like maybe hybrid repair or stuff like that, um, you know, it should be, should be pretty simple for them to do. Mm -hmm. And what are these typically going for these used ones online? Cause that's the only way to really get a new charger in these, right? Yeah, pretty much. So typically these used chargers are going for somewhere between 500 and a thousand bucks typically. 
and then you know it takes probably about three hours of labor to, to swap it so you're in for you know let's just say eight hundred dollars thousand bucks yeah probably you know eight eight to twelve hundred is is pretty typical to see depending on you know whatever you can source the used charger for is going to be the the biggest differentiation in price right and then aside from that there's really not many issues. You keep the battery pack, you know, healthy essentially, as long as it's not degraded, yep. it's tires and you have yourself a cheap, yeah, you know, reliable true. car. Yeah, exactly. And I would personally recommend only getting a leaf with a Chatamo port as a backup, especially an early one, because if this fails, then you're screwed. Yeah. On these earlier cars, a lot less of them have Chatamo than the later cars. And yeah, I mean, if the, if the charger fails, then you're, you're kind of stuck. Um, and yeah, so I would definitely recommend one with Chatamo as well. And then find one that wasn't used with Chatamo right. very often. <laughs> with Chatamo, but not used too often on Chatamo is right. kind of the key there. And do you want to explain that to our audience, why that would be the case, why you wouldn't want a car that had heavy DC charging? Yeah, so the biggest issue on the lease is that the battery has zero thermal management. There's no, no cooling mechanism at all for the battery. It would be uh, what we might call um, passively cooled, uh, which, you know, really means no cooling. Um, and of course, charging the battery on a DC fast charger is going to heat up the battery and then it just doesn't have a way to, to get that heat away. And the heat is what really, you know, kills these batteries in ter terms of the degradation. Um, anybody that's, um, you know, owned a leaf in a, in a warmer or particularly a really hot climate like Phoenix or, or places like that know that the batteries degrade really heavily in places like that. Or of course, a car like this one that lived most of its life in Washington the battery's still in reasonably good shape just because, uh, you know, it lived in a pretty, pretty mild climate. Yeah, and you were saying this car has nine bars remaining. Yeah, nine, nine capacity bars, which would put it at about, oh, somewhere in the mid to high 70% range for capacity, which mm -hmm. for a 2012 Leaf is doing pretty good. Yeah, and I think if we check Leaf Spy, it says right around that 70% health yeah. uh, type situation. So cool beans. So you got the 12 volt disconnected. Yep. So the low voltage systems de are dead. Yep, low voltage systems are dead. Let me grab another tool over here real quick. Getting out the Milwaukee over here. Yep. <laughs> no skimping here. <laughs> I'll pop over to the other side so I can show what, what you're going to do here. I've never seen the high voltage disconnect uh, come out on this particular one. Thank you. It looks like you've got your old battery. That's right. We should discard that uh, properly. Yeah, we can. These we can throw out as well. They just flew off the car. They were like a little, little wind mirror, uh, yeah. windshield things. Yeah, got some tint that we pulled off the windshield. <laughs> oh, yeah, a little bit of, <laughs> yeah, like the top, but I don't know. We just, I'm surprised Patrick and Liv still left all that in the car. So we've got a this little carpet hmm. plastic panel thing pops up, and then we have a little metal cover under here. It just has three 10 millimeter bolts in it. How about that? Not even painted to match. Yep. Yeah. Usually these are just a, just a gray panel. And then we've got our high voltage disconnect down here. These early cars have a much bigger disconnect than the later ones do. And we'll just press that little tab there and then pull up on the green handle and boom, we're disconnected. Wow. That is so cool. So all of the high voltage flows through that connector, basically. It's kind of in the middle of the path, so it's closer than half when you're with this. And then what we always do here um, in the shop, is we're working on the high voltage systems in the car. Uh, we always put the disconnect on the dash where everybody can see it. That way okay. the car is safe. And we always have all the doors unlocked with the windows down. That way nobody can get locked out of it. So right. Very that's cool. Always key. So now it's basically let's pull the interior part and get to the onboard charger. Yep, that's pretty much it. Um, what I'm actually probably going to do first is I'll actually uh, disconnect the coolant lines and kind of drain the coolant out of it. Um, that way we don't make too much of a mess. And so explain that to me because we were just saying how the leaf was air cooled, uh, especially from a battery component. So what is actually liquid cooled on this car? Yeah. So all of the powertrain components are still liquid cooled. Um, they just use regular glycol based coolant. Um, just the battery itself is not, not cooled at all. So the, there's actually, you know, all the coolant uh, cooling stuff for the motor and the DC to DC converter and all the stuff under the hood. And then it literally has coolant lines that run all the way to the back of the car just for the charger. Which wow, is, so they run them all the way back. Why wouldn't they just put the charger under the hood? They did that starting in 2013. So oh, okay. In, in 2013, they moved the charger under the hood, but for whatever reason, in, in 2011 and 2012, 
they stuck it in the back. So. And my understanding is this is a 3.3 kilowatt onboard charger? Yep, 3.3. That was the only only option available on the 11 and 12. Starting in 2013, they had an optional 6.6. And it was basically two of their three threes, I would imagine. Um, well, it's actually, so the whole charger unit itself was different. Oh, wow. Um, you know, internally, it's just got the, you know, the extra uh, capability to handle the extra power. Yeah. But yeah, it, it started out as just an optional thing. Starting in 2013, you could get the 6.6. Not all of them have it, but, you know, a lot of them do. Um, and then once it got up to like probably must be 2015, I think, if I remember correctly, I think that that's when they made the 6.6 skater. Very cool. Well, cool beans. I guess we'll get it up and drain some coolant out of it. Yep, let's do it. You know, all these years I was under the impression that there were no fluids in an electric car. I'm just joking. Of course they have fluids. But some people are like, I have fluid in my electric car. Yeah, some people have no idea. But obviously, you know, every electric car has a gear reduction box and you have to have lubrication. So there's always, you know, some amount of oil in them, usually a pretty small amount. Um, in the case of, you know, the large drive units and stuff, it's like a quart and a half of, you know, Dextrom 6 ATF. Yeah. Sure. And then here, of course, we have the, uh, just the water glycol situation. Yep. Yeah. So we've got our coolant lines that run all the way from the front of the car. We have the two, uh, hard lines right here that terminate at a couple of, couple of little rubber elbows on the charger. And then the charger's that right there. Yep. That's so the, the bottom the, of it. The, yep. So that's the bottom of the charger. Um, you can kind of see on the other one over there where the, where the coolant nipples are poking out from, from the bottom. So yep. That's, that's what we're looking at right here under the car. Uh-huh. And it's got kind of a little rubber bellows to, to seal it off and all. So um, I'm actually going to grab a couple clamps to clamp those hoses off so we don't lose all the coolant in the system. We just want to drain what's in the charger itself. Sure. Will we have to refill some or it's got enough capacity? Yeah, we'll have to refill some. We'll just put put whatever coolant we take out back into it. Oh, nice. And that way we'll be all good on the on the coolant levels. Okay, great. So that's why you were cleaning the inside of this. Yep. I couldn't so, quite figure out what so you're we'll, doing. We'll reuse that that the coolant that we take out and then yeah that, that'll, that'll be all good great and that's just gonna pinch them tight yep yeah so these are actually just like a these are like literally just a, a surgical tool huh. and we'll just pinch those hoses closed and then we'll take clamps off so this one actually is kind of almost like a little bit of a drain it just has a blank end on it. So that way we won't make quite as much of a mess. Clamp back on here. Oh, horse running down my arm there. Yeah, <laughs> nice. It's okay, get a shower at work. Awesome. Looks like our one clamp there is not quite doing as much of a job as I'd like, so I'll kind of reclamp that one. Yep. We are now, I don't know, 20 minutes into the process at most? Yeah, probably 20, 30 minutes or something. Okay. Um, yeah. And let's show the viewers what the car looks like. Yeah, so we've got the whole interior pulled apart. We've got the back seat out, uh, the plastic hump. There's another kind of a sheet metal bracket that goes on the back there. Uh, we've got a little bit of an archaeological dig under the seat here. Found a bunch of money. That's always fun, right? Yeah, some dollar coins and... Yeah, a couple couple dollar coins, Canadian quarters. Yeah, it's interesting. Kind of fun stuff. Yeah. And um, what are we looking at here? Because obviously this is the onboard charger, but what is this? Yeah, so this is the onboard charger. This is a big capacitor assembly doohickey that... Honestly, I'm not 100% certain what its actual purpose is. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, well, it's not needed uh, for us to do anything with it right now. Yep. Not not needed for, for what we're doing right now. But yeah, we'll get all the stuff unplugged on the charger here. And then it's just uh, just a handful of bolts that hold it in. Yeah, I'm going to come around. So what? Uh, how did we actually unplug all that? Could you show us how that all works? Yeah. So we've got, um, we've got a couple different plugs that we have to undo here. So this is our AC input coming from the charge port. Okay. So that goes into this box that kind of does some distribution, and then it inputs it into the charger through this connector. Mm -hmm. So it's filtered essentially before it goes to the charger. Yeah, it's filtered before it gets into the charger. It's a big bug flying around. Yeah, dang, this thing is huge. Um, then we've got some some of our communication, our low voltage harnesses. So, you know, of course we have our our proximity and pilot coming from the charge port. 
um, probably some, you know, some CAN communication to talk to the VMS and the other systems in the car, uh, high voltage interlock, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so this cable right here is coming from the DC side. So this probably connects to probably the inverter assembly under the hood. Um, and then it's the the DC output from the charger where it'll where it'll go to the battery. So. And is there a way to know if this is the charger that came with the vehicle originally? Yeah. So actually, right here we have a date code on the sticker, and we can see that the charger was manufactured on June sixth of twenty twelve. Okay. Yep. Yep. So almost certainly an original charger. Yeah. Very cool. And um, I guess what's going to happen with this charger it'll get uh, probably opened up by someone at some point and repaired or just thrown in the trash or what happens um potentially um we'll probably um i don't know if i would say that we'd throw it away because that's kind of wasteful um maybe we, we can take it back and put it on the wall there there you go you can take it back and put it on the wall yeah uh, it can be a you know a decoration piece i think we'll um, do that that'll be kind of neat for someone that's skilled with you know circuit board level repair it could potentially be fixed um you know what the the diode issue um we we didn't show it on the video but earlier i actually did check at the charge port and confirmed that the diode is blown in the open position okay um, so. so the charge port uh, check you just did that as a quick yep i just yeah. did that as a quick check with the multimeter and yeah it's the the diode is blown on on the proximity side and mm -hmm. so that's the issue and it, it can't be fixed with an external diode right um, but. Which it's possible, like you mentioned, there's maybe a 20% chance, roughly, that it could have been if yeah, it was blown in the other way. There, there's some percentage chance that it could have blown in the other way, um, and then it would be repairable with just an external diode. Okay. But in so this particular case, it's not. Now, I guess the next step is, we'll unplug this, unbolt it, slap the new one in. This is really a fast, simple situation. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty quick process once you know what you're doing, and yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, getting that done. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Well, we are just a few moments later. The connections are undone. The bolts are undone. And this thing's ready to be lunched out of the car. So oh, there it goes. So we get hung up a little bit on our coolant lines that poke through the bottom there. There we go. There we go. One charger removed. How about that? Epic. So now no charger. So that was the cause of the problems of our leaf right here. Yeah, there you go. There's the culprit. Dang. Well, I think, yeah, we'll keep that for sure. And then if one of our viewers wants to attempt a repair, we'll send it out to them and uh, see if they can figure out you know, what's going on there. Or maybe we send it to the EV Learning Center or something. We had a lot of ideas. Yeah, some, someone that wants to try and attempt a, a board level repair, you know, for, for somebody that's versed in that kind of thing, it's, it's certainly something that could be done. So. Sure. Well, it's not uh, no use throwing it out and putting it to waste. We'll keep it around until someone decides they want to do something with it. Yeah, if nothing else, it's a display piece, right? Yeah, it's certainly a cool display piece. So yeah, and then the other one, I guess, just kind of goes in the way you took it out. Yeah, so I'll, I'll do a little bit of cleanup. I'll just kind of vacuum up all the stuff that was under the seat. Thank you, yeah. And uh, and then we'll throw the new charger in there. Epic, sounds great, thank you. All right, so this is the new old charger that is presumably working. Yep, new old charger that presumably works. Great. We'll find out here shortly. Watch it get like two charge sessions and then die. And then, yeah. <laughs> that, would be sad. that would be sad. But also this car in particular had really a lot of AC charging on it. Again, very little DC charging and I forget the mileage, but 75,000 miles, something like that. So I'm assuming this onboard charger has been used less than that. Right, so we cleaned up the little connection point down there so that it has a nice seal. Yeah, so our little, our little bellows there where the coolant lines go through should be able to seal up right there. Get our bolt holes lined up. Pretty much anything like this always has kind of alignment holes. Okay. Those are always the ones that go in first. And was this one produced? This one is actually just a touch older than the yeah. other one. Yeah. Built at the end of 2011. Mm-hmm. Very nice. And of course, before we put everything totally back together, we'll test it and make sure it works. Ah, good, good plan, good plan. So now we have the car back on the lift, everything kind of loosely put together in there, nothing super tight. Putting the coolant lines back on the little nubs here. 
And uh, this way we can do a little test fire situation before we screw everything down, make sure that the charger actually works and all that good stuff. So just kind of getting it all back loosely, make sure it charges and then the final touches. I mean, this is really a simple, simple process. I mean, uh, dang, I think if Alex did this every day, rather than <laughs> ripping his fingers off, he could, uh, he could probably do this in an hour if he's fast. Yeah, I mean, once once you get the hang of these, they're they're pretty quick to do. I've actually only ever done maybe one or two other charger swaps on these. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you that it's much easier than a charger swap on a Rav Four. That's a whole <laughs> different beast. Sure, Rav Four seems like a complicated machine for sure. This looks like a really complicated coolant fill situation we got going on here. Yeah, the uh, the fill hole in this reservoir is teeny tiny. And why? Kind of trickle it in. There's two reservoirs. There's three, if you include the one I'm filling right now. <laughs> three reservoirs. kind of weird. Um, this one is like kind of the overflow reservoir. Okay. And everything else is kind of part of the system. If you, if you were to take those caps off, the fluid is all the way up to the very top. Oh, interesting. So it fills right up to here. Why they decided to put actual reservoirs on those, I don't know. Maybe it's for bleeding or or something like that. But Okay. But basically, this is the exact coolant that we took out of the charger. Yep, and I'm running it through just kind of a little fine mesh strainer so that any dirt that could have ended up in it will get filtered out. And we probably won't be able to put it all in right away because it'll... Yeah, it's got to suck like, some in there. Yeah, it'll have to purge a little bit of air out of the system. All right, so the interlock is going back in. Interlock going back in, and then we'll connect the 12-volt battery and see how everything works. Okay, that sounds like a good plan. So interlock in, high voltage is now connected. 12 volt, obviously the car doesn't do anything because it still doesn't have any low voltage running through. Right, yep, yeah. so we'll reconnect our negative terminal here. Okay, there we go. Just cinch that down a little bit. Yep. Make sure the car starts up. Uh-huh, yes, got to make sure no fault codes or anything, of course. And then we should get Leaf Spy in this thing and see how that goes in a second. There you go. Looks like we're all operation normal. Okay. No error messages. State of charge is pretty low, right? Yeah. What were we at there? Maybe 13 miles or something? Oh, 21 yeah. miles. So 21 charge. miles. But uh, yeah, maybe, maybe yeah, 30%, only. 40%. Uh, it's at Thebard right now, so probably about 25%. Okay, 25%, yeah. Oh, this is exciting. Now this makes this car actually usable. Yeah, <laughs> just a little, yeah, 120 volt EVSC right there. That's all you need, honestly. It's great for testing. Yeah. All right, here's the magic moment. We're in. Oh, it's never done this. The clicks are happening and it's blinking. It's blinking. It's charging. Oh, no way indicator light on here well that one doesn't actually say charging it just right. says power, power. <laughs> yeah and let's look inside the uh instrument cluster to see if it shows anything yes it's blinking with the charging icon hey high five epic got Wait. the thing charging no way so uh wow that just makes this car so much more usable right there i mean yep. the the value to us has just gone through the roof now it makes all the difference to actually be able to charge the car. That's right. And I think I've had this car almost a whole year now. Only only having Chad Mo? Yeah, that's, that's well, pretty rough. I just kind of didn't drive it. Wow. <laughs> sure. Cool. Now, now that we know that it works, uh, we'll get the rest of the interior off and back together, get the seats and everything in. Yep. So just kind of put it back together now, and that'll be the plan. But this thing's chugging the juice. How about that? Yep. Great. Amazing. And here it goes, the final clip-in. I'm sure this wasn't the cleanest seat cushion you've ever worked on. Not quite, but <laughs> actually for, for one of these Leafs with this color interior, not the worst I've seen. Okay, I'll, that's I'll that's, that's encouraging. That. that is encouraging. Well, everything is good. You know, Some of our viewers may not know, but this actually has rear heated seats. Yep, rear heated seat. That was kind of a standard thing on these older older leaves so that's kind of cool i think the idea was heated steering wheel heated seat so that um you didn't have to use the heater in the car yep 
So like Nissan was like, you're buying this car. We know it's going to be a miserable ownership experience. So <laughs> just awesome. So now we're back to good. How about that? And it charges. What a machine. I was taking a look at that full of battery bit that was in here. I'm pretty sure that was the original 12 volt battery for this car. Yeah, I think it may have been. Yeah. It's amazing it lasted so long. Yeah, it is pretty amazing that it lasted as long as it did. It's like my Coda Electric actually is still on the original. Really? It still has the original 12 volt? Still, and it's 10 years and it works great. But I guess same age as this car. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. So um, what we should do is we should, uh, once we get it out and plugged in, let's plug it into uh, Leaf Spy. Yeah, we can do that real quick for sure. Yeah, get get some of the data on this. Because I've had Leaf Spy on this before. And yeah, be curious to see what, what it does. And then I also want to go um, up on the higher power one, up to 100% charge. And uh, first time in probably years that it's been full charged. Look, we're on the, we're on the second blinking light now. On the Oh, yeah, check that out. It is charging up. <laughs> well, we are pretty much all put back together. We're just going to be uh, protecting some of these uh, coolant, uh, I guess, hoses or nubs or nipples, as you call them, which I think is really funny. <laughs> Udders, maybe. And uh, yeah, so that'll go back in this little box. So we'll keep that in the leaf for now. And then uh, we'll get it uh, plugged into the high power. They have a, a higher power uh, J1772 port, even a Chatamo charger here, which is great. But I'm really interested in the AC charging, of course. And so we'll get it plugged into uh, where my Model S is charging right now. So I have the S right here, juicing up, pulled in at 2% or something like that. I figured coming to QC charge, they got to have a charger. And we're charging on the J long right now, which is just an extension cable for uh, J1772. So very interesting to see all of that, of course. So the J long 40 amps max, and we are charging at 40 amps. So neat stuff. What are we up to? We're at 19%. So we've put in... 15 kilowatt hours. So in the amount of time it takes to add 15 kilowatt hours to a Model S, we have completely done, uh, you know, an onboard charger swap in the Leaf. That's how quickly it took. Just amazing. Oh, we got forklift certified Alex over here. <laughs> get, it, get it a little bit moved out of the way here. <laughs> Electric forklift. That thing's nice. Electric forklift. And uh, this, this right here is our attachment for moving dead cars around. Oh, so you hook that up to the wheels and then you can push them around. Yep. Exactly. They call it a forklift wrecker. Forklift wrecker. <laughs> it's great. Just awesome stuff here. Love that it's fully electric. I would be such a menace to society on this thing. It'd be, it goes almost 10 miles an hour. 10 miles an hour. Dude, you could take out so many people with this thing. You could do some serious damage. And I think it weighs almost 7,000 pounds. 7,000 pounds. Actually, it might be more than that. It's rated to lift 40 200 pounds 4200 pound lifting capacity yeah wow it's amazing well uh i guess we'll pull this over to this end of the garage get it juicing and then give it a good old full charge and here we go the leaf has been pulled around so let's get it up we can max out the 3.3 kilowatt onboard charger here we won't be needing the tesla connector of course so uh could you pull off the little adapter oh yep thank there you there you go and in we go with the high powered, doing this left handed J1772 connection. We get the beep and it clicks. Contactors are going and it is actually charging. So we'll let this juice up to full and then we'll pull out Leaf Spy, check the, check the balance of the pack, see how that all looks. Yeah, we'll see, see how it is and hopefully it's all good. Yeah, hopefully. Well, let's see. Well, you join us uh, now a few hours later where the car has reached 100% state of charge. We then unplugged it, let it sit for, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, yeah, something 20, like that. 20, 30 minutes, something like that. And now we've just plugged it back in and you can actually see it's still accepting another top charge. So we're just kind of walking it, you know, whacking it up top and showing, okay, here, let's get as much juice in there as possible. But um, you think we could hook up Leaf Spy and show everyone what's going on with that? Yeah, so I've got a little Bluetooth dongle here that we can... We can plug in real quick. And Leaf Spy is such an amazing tool. I believe run by the community. I don't. It's. I don't think it's very much money, if anything. Yeah, uh, the Leaf Spy Pro version. I don't remember how much it costs off the top of my head, but I think it's under ten bucks for the app, and it gets you so much useful data from the car that it's just. Yeah. This is also a smart idea to put this red tag on your OBD yes, dongle. I've, I've left a few of these in people's cars before, so I put, yeah. I put a little flag on it. So that <laughs> I think every people. press car that we have, I just it goes back with. They must be like, right. why does Out of Spec keep logging this stuff? Uh, <laughs> got the key. 
I have the key. Uh, see if I can find it. Uh, let me jump in there. I'll yeah. turn her on real quick. So, feels good to be back in the leaf. I have yet to drive it this trip, actually. But we are going to take it to dinner here. There we go. And it is at 67 miles of range indicated. How about that? Uh, and that's not even in eco mode. So this is really a range machine here. Whoops. If we come here, energy info. Yeah, you can see we're just burning a little bit of stuff, but everything's off right now. So what does Leaf Spy actually do? Because it will show you pretty much everything about the car that you can get from CAN data. Yeah, so I've, I've got it pulled up right here and you can see we've got a bunch of info on the screen. So we have our state of charge, which is actually only showing, you know, just a hair under 94%. Mm -hmm. um, and then the 65.1%, that's kind of representative of your state of health. Yep. So that's, you know, amount of capacity compared to new, which for a car this age is, is really not too bad, actually. Okay, so pretty reasonable. We yeah, got lucky reasonable. it was a Pacific Northwest car. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if we scroll to the next page, Ooh. that's your cell voltage histogram. Okay. Uh, which, it, you know, it looks like a lot of ups and downs, but yeah. you're only 27 millivolts, which, you know, not the best, but it's not terrible for a leaf actually okay so okay. maybe if we had continued only dc charging it and actually drove the car quite a bit this would have gotten worse potentially yeah okay. so i mean i imagine that with a little, little bit of driving around and you know getting back into level two uh charging yeah. it might decrease a little bit okay um and it gives you some other info up here it's a little bit it's real small print but you can see this actually says that there's only been 87 quick charges for the lifespan of the car and uh, almost 4,800 level one and level two charge oh, sessions. Oh, wow. Now, is that reading that off of the onboard charger we just put in? Nope, so that's off of the battery management system. That's okay. all stored in the BMS, yeah. So interesting, yeah. So wow, it's, very, it's had very few quick charging sessions, only 84. And 80, I think- 87. 87. Which, yeah, I mean, that's that's not very many for, for a 10 year old car. Yeah, not many. L less than eight. Well, yeah, only less than nine per year on average. Right, so right? less than once a month it was fast charged. Right, yep. Um, and then, yeah, so on this page it's actually showing 66.5% state of health. Right, that's the number I remember it seeing before. Yep. So 66.5, that would put you at, it shows nine bars on the dash. It's probably about to lose its ninth bar and go down to eight bars. Actually, it did go down one and then it came back. Oh, interesting, yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot of the time, usually it'll dip a little bit below the threshold before it actually drops the bar. So it okay. must have been kind of a weird borderline thing. Yep. Yeah. I remember starting it once and watching it go, I think it's a little low and I checked my phone screen and then, you know, five minutes into the drive, it popped back up or something. Yeah. So it, it'll probably lose that, you know, within a relatively short amount of time. Okay. Eight bars, but yeah. And then there's just another voltage histogram mm -hmm. and, you know, some other, some other info, state of health. Right. It's basically all the same info just shown as sort of, you know, quote unquote, analog gauges. Sure. And then if we go up here, there's a bunch of other stuff you can do. Um, there's a bunch of settings that you can set for it. Um, and if you want to do um, like clearing error messages and stuff, mm -hmm. there's a option on here. Where is that? Service screen. So if mm -hmm. you hit the service screen and then we hit our back button, now it gives us a service menu where we can do a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that you can actually do is um, if you read the DTCs, which you know, uh -huh. probably doesn't have any other than maybe a couple of like just weird random stuff. Right, it says like, okay, now and all that good stuff. Right, yeah. So if we go back, now we could hit a clear DTCs. And in the case of doing a battery swap, this uh, app will actually let you reflash the battery so that the battery will actually work in the car. Right. Isn't that incredible that a, a silly phone app lets yep. you program a battery upgrade to your Leaf? That's if we were to put in a 40 or 62 kilowatt hour pack. Oh, so that won't work on an upgraded battery. It'll oh, okay. only work on a, on a, you know, factory original size battery. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So you couldn't say, okay, I put the 40 in here. Yeah. On a 40 battery, um, you'd have to put in a can bridge. Uh, okay. All that work. And so... Um, well, cool. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I have Leaf Spy. I use it whenever I drive this car and it's just been, it's been so helpful and so cool and surprised it's still taking energy again. So Patrick and Liv, you guys will have to full charge it a couple times and let it sit low and, you know, basically wake it back up. But 
Thank you, sir, for a fully functional leaf. Yeah, you betcha. <laughs> Just epic. And uh, yeah, can't thank you guys enough. The work was amazing. And actually, it was a really fun day here because we saw the guy with the Roadster who drove around the world. And I was over at the EV Learning Center. So just absolutely amazing. Thank you guys for watching this video and following along on the leaf process. I know it's a long one, but man, this car deserves all the airtime. This thing rocks. You can have cheap, reliable electric transportation right here with an old used leaf. I mean, these things are simple and you saw how quickly Alex just swapped out a failed component. It's really not a bad choice for a driver. So thanks again for watching and we'll see you on another one soon. Bye-bye.